Hello there. I'm here for your daily dose of philosophy. And I want to tell you about part four of Atheism for Lent. Now, as many of you know, I'm creating these daily videos that are going through the journey of Atheism for Lent, not only to uh, tell you about what you might expect, but also to create a series of videos that perhaps help to draw out this conversation that has been going on for thousands of years uh, within the world of faith about atheism and theism, agnosticism, agnosticism. And in many ways, you could think of the life of faith as involving participation in a conversation. It is, I think of it like uh, going to an art gallery. There are some people who love to go to galleries, look at the art, be impacted by the art, talk about it with other people who also love the art. And what's most important to those people, I would say, probably in general, is not that they hang out with people who agree with their interpretation of the artwork, but rather people who are drawn to the same artwork, who enjoy conversing about it, arguing about it, reflecting on it. And in a similar way, to be invited into the life of faith is to find yourself being taken up in a conversation that you find enlivening and transformative, or at the very least, better than watching Netflix, right? And in Atheism for Lent, you begin to see that this conversation has a history and you're able to embed yourself within that history a little bit. And I've talked about how in Atheism for Lent, you start to see the different shapes of theism and atheism and how they influence each other. And we look at trying to get to the most mature, rigorous form of each shape and then we see how that shape can give way to something else and we've also already looked at the part one the classical arguments for the existence of god part two which will be some of the classic arguments critiquing god and then part three which whenever i talk about it as a roller coaster is the first real exhilarating dimension of the course where we look at people like Meister Reckhart, Julian of Norwich, uh, we look at uh, John Cage is in there and others, uh, exploring how theism and atheism merge within what's called the apophatic tradition, the mystical tradition. Now, one of the things that comes out of that, uh, in a nutshell, and these small videos are only five to ten minutes long, so they lack nuance. And I have to say that we will get into the nuance more within the decentering practice itself. But at the moment, uh, forgive me for uh, painting broad brushstrokes. But one of the things that comes out of part three is the idea that uh, religion at its best is a response to an event that we cannot conceptualize, that short circuits us and decenters us and destabilizes us. It's a type of discourse or creates a type of discourse, meaning something that sets you off course. And a theological language in many ways is a kind of hymn, a kind of poetics, a kind of worshipful response to that which ultimately transcends our ability to grasp through our senses and through our conceptual apparatus. Now this means that broadly speaking within that apophatic tradition, religion as it's practiced in terms of its beliefs and its liturgies and its rituals uh, reflects us as individuals or a society. There are creations it's almost like building a cathedral in the, in the aftermath of some personal event. The cathedral is a response, a worshipful response, but it doesn't describe what you encountered so much as it describes your response to what you encountered. And if you're a great architect and a great builder, what you create will be beautiful. And if you lack those skills, what you create will be a little shed, right? Um, so there are differences, uh, but there's still a response. And in a similar way, if someone responds to the event of saturation, 
the kind of the religious experience and they are very educated, have spent a lifetime in reflection and meditation and thought, then their response will obviously be more beautiful uh, than someone who doesn't have those skills or has not had the time to develop that kind of education or, or that kind of poetic skill. Um, but both of them are legitimate but one will probably be read for thousands of years after the person has died and, you know, the other won't. So someone like, uh, I'm thinking of the Confessions by Augustine, it's, uh, it's something that continues to be read because it is such a beautiful text, read by people who have uh, a religious bent and those who don't, because it has a deep insight into some of the dimensions of what it is to be human. Anyway, that leaves an opening for us to look at one of the really interesting shapes. This will be the second shape of, of uh, maybe philosophical atheism that you'll be coming across in this course. The first was the kind of classic new atheist stuff that we looked at in the second week. Here, we look at what can be called the imminent critique of religion or the material critique or the sociological critique. There's various names we could give to it. But to kind of sum up what you'll be uh, discovering this week uh, in part four, you could say that it takes up this mystical idea and says, yes, well, religion is something that we create, that we form, that does something. And, you know, Feuerbach, who's very, very important in this week, uh, this is one of my favorite weeks. I can't really say my favorite week because I, I really genuinely get so much out of each week. But this week is where I spent a lot of my formal education in. I was very interested in the work of people like Nietzsche and Feuerbach and Marx and, and Hegel before them. Um, and so this week has, a, I suppose, a special place in my heart. And Feuerbach's always been one of my favorite kind of philosophers. Uh, he's a philosopher who um, I definitely disagree with fundamentally in many ways, but find very, very important. Um, and I'll talk about him a lot in this seminar. But what you see with someone like Feuerbach is the idea that, okay, imagine religion is exactly what the mystics say it is then that experience is something that is uh, you know, relatively rare. Some people have it and maybe they go off and they live in solitude or they, they write their great book. But he says, but religion you know, is what the hundreds of millions of people do, right? Religion is what people who confess to be religion do, the weekly going to church or mosque or synagogue, a temple, uh, the prayers, the books they read, the, even the schools they go to. And so let's, uh, let's look at religion as it's practiced by everyday people. Maybe there are some individuals who are having these encounters with this saturated event, or maybe they're having a psychotic break. Who knows? But let's look at religion as it's practiced in the world and what does it do. And so this shape of atheism doesn't kind of critique the notion of God or that God exists. It looks at the function of religion. And you have then this week encounters with people like Feuerbach, who says that actually religion at its best uh, helps us see ourselves as a society. What religion does is it helps us see what justice is and love is and fairness is. Like we begin to work it out by putting it out there onto God. And for Feuerbach, the success of religion and the success of theology is when it realizes it's doing that. So theology reaches a success at the very moment that it dissipates, at the very moment that we realize that, in the words of Feuerbach, theology is anthropology. We are speaking about ourselves when we think we're speaking of something else. So Feuerbach is a, what he calls a friend of religion. He's a very theologically informed philosopher. And he charts how our understanding of faith and our understanding of God actually helps us see the potential, not of individuals, but the potential of the human race, the potential that we have as, as, a, as a, a species. 
to bring justice, to bring fairness, to feed the poor, to to look after those who have uh, have a, a situation where they are powerless, right, where they have no voice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we also have uh, critiques of religion that show how it's just useful in terms of social solidarity or um, in terms of creating a less fragmented society, et cetera, et cetera, or working through violence. And also those who say that religion is ideological, that actually it ultimately helps protect the powerful against the powerless and is used as a way to keep people downtrodden. Um, all of these are reflections on what is actually existing religion. Uh, looking at it, what it does, how it's formed, what, uh, what benefits it has and who those benefits are for. You know, with Feuerbach, as I say, he saw religion as telling us something about the essence of humanity. Whereas Karl Marx, who takes a lot of Feuerbach on, but he says, well, no, religion doesn't tell you about human beings in their eternal essence. It tells us about who we are in our historical epoch, i.e. our religion and our gods tell us about the ideals of the given society uh, at that time. It doesn't tell us about justice in its eternal dimension, but rather how we think of justice in a particular age. It is, he calls it, a type of encyclopedia of the the current age. Um, and so we have people, I mean, we're going to look at Simone de Beauvoir, uh, Emma Goldman's here, Feuerbach, I think Freud is there. Uh, we're going to look at these critiques. Now, there is a form of atheism in it, but it's indirect. It's not a metaphysical atheism that's arguing that God doesn't exist or taking seriously the arguments for God. Uh, what it kind of does is it, say, analyzes the believer and the structures of religion. And nothing is much is left over. So if you could imagine, uh, for example, if you have eczema and you get a cream from your doctor, some, uh, some cream that you rub on every day, uh, like with some steroids in it or whatever, and after a month, the eczema clears up. But at the same time, your grandmother has been lighting a candle in church every night. Now, you can say that the cream got rid of the eczema, but then your grandmother can also say, ah, yes, but, but the prayer helped and lighting the candle helped. And in a way, you can go, well, yeah, fill your boots, great. Yeah, that might have worked, that might not have, but you, the, the cream is a sufficient explanation. So these thinkers that you're going to be looking at is they're going to give what they would argue, in a sense, would be sufficient uh, descriptions of religion and religious believers and of beliefs that don't disprove something out there or something else, but it makes it kind of superfluous. You don't need that extra, extra explanation. It's, it adds something, or well, it adds nothing. It's an addition which doesn't have any real explanatory power or any value. Um, think of it, for example, like, you know, with Freud, uh, where you say, and this is not, again, simplifying for the sake of this short video, uh, but uh, for neurotics, when the person might not be able to go to sleep unless they've checked all of their windows every night to make sure that they're locked. Right? And this ritual, this private ritual, which they do every night, even if they don't open the windows, they have to go around and check so as to allay their anxiety and anxiety about other things, obviously, but it's put onto this. So this is the reason for the anxiety in the mind of the neurotic. Uh, in a similar way, religion is just public uh, rituals to allay neuroses. There are ways in which we do certain activities that allay certain existential anxieties and personal anxieties. Um, yeah, I mean, so existential meaning kind of related to uh, human existence as such, and then personal anxieties that are related to your personal history. And religion allows for, gives certain rituals that allay that anxiety. Uh, now again, you can add something extra, but if that explanation is sufficient, then uh, you're not disproving that, oh, and also they meet God through doing this. It's just, it doesn't really add anything 
of much value. It's like, okay, boomer, say whatever you want, but here we've got we've got a sufficient explanation. And you know, you have explanations in relation to the economy, economics, Marx, uh, neurosis with Freud, uh, the will with Nietzsche and Schopenhauer that um, potentially give us ways of understanding religion without recourse to the mystics and what they had. So you'll notice part four, again, takes up what's going on in part three and then takes it in a different direction and does something with it. Uh, now, in part five, we'll then uh, encounter some of the existential theologians who now take up what we're talking about in part four and um, affirm it and bring it somewhere very interesting. Uh, and that will include people, I think Karl Barth is even in there, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Paul Tillich and others. Okay, so that's just a little brief explanation of part four of Atheism for Lent. As I say, it kicks off very, very soon, 14th of February. If you'd like to be part of that journey with me, just fire over to my website and you'll find the details. All right, take care. Bye-bye.